Lindsley. I am the director of programs here at Jet Foundation. Um, thank you all for joining us today as we welcome Dine and their team to discuss advancing the promise of force to deliver for patients. We are always grateful to our partners like Dine for helping us make these webinars possible um, and bringing information right into your home. So um, we appreciate them sharing their updates and their knowledge with us and our community. So before we get started, I do just want to mention a few things. Today's webinar will be about 30 minutes, and then we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. There is a Q&A box, which is, for me, on the bottom right side of the screen. It has little two little boxes that you can use. Please do put your questions in there. We do our best to monitor the chat, um, but we do primarily look at questions in that Q&A panel. We are also streaming live to Facebook, so we do try to get questions there as well. So if you do have questions on Facebook, please feel free to submit, and we will do our best to get to those and put them in the, the Q&A panel for you. Um, but uh, we do primarily use that Q&A box. This webinar is also being recorded, so it will be available later if for any reason you have to hop off or if there's anyone that you know that was interested in this webinar and may not have been able to attend today. So um, with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Ash Dugar, Chief Medical Affairs Officer at Dine Therapeutics. He brings over 20 years of experience across medical affairs, clinical and commercial development, and real world evidence. So thank you, thank you so much, Ash. We are so happy to have you and I will hand it off to you. Great, thank you so much, Alexa. Um, so as Alexa said, uh, my name is Ash Dugar. I'm the Chief Medical Affairs Officer at Dine Therapeutics. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Alexa, Julie, and the entire Jet Foundation for the opportunity to present an exciting update on our Duchenne program to the community. And before I begin, I'd like to introduce you to our new head of patient advocacy, Catherine Beaverson. As many of you know, Catherine has, a, has been part of the neuromuscular advocacy community for many years and brings a ton of experience and passion to the role. Uh, she's taking over for Molly White, but please know that Molly isn't going too far. She's taking on a new role here at Dine. So I'm super excited in the, for, for this addition to our team with Catherine's arrival while continuing to be able to work with Molly closely in her new role. And I have to thank Molly for building Dine's key pillar, our delivering for patients core value and connecting Dine to this incredible community that we serve. So thank you. And Catherine will be back at the end of this for Q&A. Next slide, please. I'd like to remind everyone that I will be making forward-looking statements today, and you can refer to our website for more information. Next slide, please. At Diet, it all starts with our mission, to deliver meaningful therapies for people living with serious muscle diseases. This mission is woven deeply into our core values, and it inspires our employees each and every day. Next slide, please. So I've had the opportunity to talk about our scientific platform, the FORCE platform in the past. And this intentional design of our scientific platform called FORCE is indeed translating in the clinic from a safety as well as an exon skipping and dystrophin production perspective. And I'm pleased to show those results a little bit later in the presentation. By way of reminder, the FORCE platform drives our efforts to develop and deliver muscle-targeted therapeutics. It's expressly designed to address one major issue in muscle diseases, which is efficiently and reliably delivering antisense oligonucleotides, like exon-skipping PMOs, to skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle and target the genetic basis of these rare muscle disorders. It consists of three components. On the left-hand side, you can see the FAB, the, or the antigen binding fragment, or the antibody fragment. And that FAB is the top portion of this Y-shaped figure, which is a full monoclonal antibody. So we took this top portion, called the FAB, and engineered it to bind tightly to something called the transferrin receptor 1, or TFR1, which is highly expressed on the surface of muscle cells. On the bottom part of the slide, you can see the linker. It's a clinically validated linker, which we chose because of its demonstrated safety and efficacy in third-party approved products. And this linker enables precise connection 
of the FAB to the PMO. And finally, we have an exon skipping PMO, which we rationally selected to target the genetic basis of disease. This is where we leverage the modularity of the force platform. And what I mean by that is for nuclear targeting diseases such as Duchenne, we choose antisense oligonucleotide or ASO payloads. And in this case, we chose an exon skipping phosphorodiamidate morpholino oligomer or a PMO that targets the specific mutation in the DMD gene. And DYNE251 is our investigational medicine that uses an exon skipping PMO designed to enable ex the skipping of exon 51 to make shortened functional dystrophin. The force platform is designed with the goal of addressing current limitations of delivery of ASOs to muscle tissue, improving the delivery of the PMO to cardiac and skeletal muscle, including diaphragm, and for allowing increased time between doses. Next slide, please. So the mechanism of force is different from other approaches. We're essentially using the cell's natural biology to deliver our investigational medicine to muscle cells. As I mentioned, our FAB binds tightly to the TFR1 receptor. And as, as I mentioned as well, the TFR1 receptor is highly expressed across the surface of muscle cells, including skeletal and cardiac muscles. So the FAB acts as a kind of key that unlocks the TFR1 receptor and allows our PMO to enter the skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle cells and target the genetic basis of disease at the level of the nucleus. So the force platform harnesses this natural mechanism of TFR1 receptor mediated delivery to transport the PMO across the cell membrane, as you can see in this schematic. And this is differentiating because we are not using membrane destabilizing agents to deliver the PMO into the cell or leave the endosome. And here you can see the conjugate is in the endosome where the PMO is cleaved or cut and travels to the nucleus. So by targeting muscle specifically using TFR1, we have the potential for a wide therapeutic index resulting in less frequent dosing and chronic administration. And you'll see how that plays out in the clinic in a, in a, in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So today, Dyne is well on its way towards achieving the promise of force and delivering for patients. We've delivered exciting clinical proof of concept data for our Duchenne program, and I'm pleased to share the initial readouts. Next slide, please. Prior to starting our Dyne 251 clinical development program, we proactively obtained expert feedback. We engaged key opinion leaders or KOLs from various disciplines, including pediatric and adult neurology, cardiology, physical medicine and rehabilitation, pulmonology, and physical therapy. Importantly, we've gathered this feedback from across the globe. And KOLs, both in the US and outside of the US, with experience running early and late stage clinical trials, have provided advice on our overall clinical development program, including our clinical trial design, the patient population that we should be studying, the biomarker and functional endpoints to incorporate in the study, and key safety considerations. Importantly, they provided key learnings from numerous long-term natural history studies to help inform our clinical trial design and eventually to contextualize our results from our trials. It is clear that KOLs believe dystrophin continues to be a key endpoint to measure for this condition. We've also received advice directly from patients and caregivers, as well as global advocacy leaders. This includes the Duchenne Community Advisory Board, comprising of advocacy leaders from several countries around the globe. They provided insights based on their living with and being the voice of the Duchenne community, as well as experience with past and current clinical trials. This input has been absolutely critical in ensuring a patient-centric design and has included, but is not limited to, key considerations families go through for choosing whether or not to be in a clinical trial. Review of and input to our informed consent form, feedback on biopsies and functional outcomes. Very importantly, identification of the most burdensome or difficult parts of the trial, 
and how to ensure patients and families are supported throughout the process. Next slide, please. So before I go into detail on the data, I wanna provide a brief overview of the DELIVER study design. It's a phase one, two global trial that we have designed to be potentially registrational. The trial is enrolling ambulant and non-ambulant males with Duchenne who are ages four to 16 and have mutations amenable to exon 51 skipping therapy. Patients who have been previously treated with an exon skipping therapy can enroll and deliver after a 12 week washout period of their current exon skipping therapy. The primary endpoints are safety, tolerability, and change from baseline into strophin levels as measured by a technique called Western blot. Secondary endpoints include measures of muscle function like NSAA and time function tests and exon skipping. We also have wearables to allow collection of data such as stride velocity. Next slide, please. The delivered trial consists of four parts. There's a six week screening period, a 24 week multiple ascending dose or MAD, randomized placebo control period, a 24 week open label extension, and a 96 week long-term extension. In the MAD placebo control portion of the delivered trial, participants are randomized to receive DYNE 251 or placebo every four weeks. And then all participants receive DYNE 251 every four weeks after the MAD portion. Again, we have a number of outcomes measures to evaluate function and quality of life. And for details on exclusion exclusion criteria, you can visit our ct.gov page for more information, and that number is listed at the bottom of the slide. On that ct.gov page, we also have a listing of all of our enrolling clinical trial sites. And there are many sites in the US and outside of the US. Next slide, please. Now I'll review the initial data results. We're very pleased with a favorable safety profile for DYNE 251 that we observed and deliver as of the data cutoff date. This is very differentiating from others in the field and speaks to the importance of each component of the force platform, as I mentioned earlier, the FAB, which is a portion of that monoclonal antibody, the clinically validated linker, and the choice of the exon skipping PMO. Overall, the safety profile of DI251 has been favorable through the data cutoff date. This safety data is based on 37 participants dosed through the 20 mg per kg cohort of the MAD portion of DELIVER. Most treatment emergent adverse events were mild to moderate in severity, with one serious treatment emergent adverse event that was judged unrelated per the study investigator, and this was dehydration due to gastroenteritis. There have been no reports of anemia, thrombocytopenia, kidney injury, and no clinically meaningful changes in electrolytes, including magnesium, have been observed. The safety profile has supported dose escalation through 20 mg per kg PMO equivalent dose, and approximately 275 doses have been administered in deliver as of the data cutoff date. Next slide, please. Now, turning to dystrophin expression as measured by Western blot, which is the co primary endpoint of deliver along with safety and tolerability, I'll show you the results here. The gray bar represents patients in the placebo treated group in deliver. And the blue bar represents the DYNE 251 treated patients in DELIVER. Patients treated with DYNE 251 had a mean absolute dystrophin level of 0.88% of normal at six months and a 0.28% change from baseline at six months, while the placebo group was largely unchanged. On the right side of the slide, you can see data published in the Journal of Neuromuscular Disorders where Etepplerson showed a mean absolute level of 0.3% of normal and a 0.06 change from baseline at six months. Now, in looking at these studies side by side, DYNE 251 had a 2.5 fold higher dystrophin expression at six months than Etepplerson in this published study, with a 24 fold lower total PMO dose administered four times less frequently. Now, our goal for this initial readout 
was to be at least as good as standard of care, which is a Tepperson at six months, with a very different dosing paradigm, which is once a month. We believe this is meaningful for patients. So these data are compelling, and we believe we are on track to achieve higher levels of dystrophin in our dose optimization cohorts, the 10, 20, and 40 milligram per kilogram cohorts, PMO equivalent dose, where we hope to see 5 to 10 percent dystrophin production at six months. We know from work others have done in the field that dystrophin builds over time, and others have seen a doubling of dystrophin expression out to 96 weeks. And we believe a 10 to 20 percent dystrophin production would significantly alter the trajectory of disease for patients. Next slide, please. Next, we look at percent dystrophin positive fibers, or PDPF. Now, this measure is important because quantifying the localization of dystrophin to the cell membrane helps provide confidence that there should be functional benefit. Again, the gray and blue bars represent placebo and the DYNE 251 treated groups, respectively, in deliver. And you can see that DYNE 251 demonstrated 22.2% mean level of dystrophin positive fibers and a 19.8% change from baseline at six months. In the Etaplerson trial, again, a separate trial published in Journal of Neuromuscular Disorders, Etaplerson showed a 19.6% mean, mean level of PDPF and a 10.7% change from baseline at six months. Next slide, please. So to summarize these compelling deliver data, we showed that dying 251 dose monthly at the initial five mg per kg dose, PMO equivalent, showed an increase in percent dystrophin at six months. We also showed an increase in PDPF at six months. And importantly, we demonstrated a favorable safety profile at 20 mg per kg PMO equivalent, dosed every four weeks, and that cohort is fully enrolled with 40 patients total enrolled in deliver with approximately 275 doses, doses administered. So we're very encouraged by this initial data readout. In terms of next steps, one of the main goals for us in deliver in 2024 is to optimize the dose and dose regimen in deliver. And we will be presenting another clinical update in the second half of this year. And so we look forward to coming back to this community uh, with an update uh, later this year. Next slide, please. We believe this data set from Deliver illustrate the potential of the FORCE platform in developing next generation exon skipping therapies and building uh, a global Duchenne franchise. Historically, muscle delivery has been the challenge and these initial data of DYNE 251 demonstrated targeted delivery to muscle with the potential for a wide therapeutic index where other approaches have struggled. And DYNE is committed to developing a DMD portfolio leading with DYNE 251 and have identified PMOs for mutations amenable to skipping exons 53, 45, and 44. Next slide, please. And finally, we have tried to take every opportunity to listen to the Duchenne community on their needs for next generation treatments. We're working urgently to deliver for the community, including families and healthcare providers to bring a potentially meaningful treatment forward that changes the trajectory of the disease. Thank you to the families for being generous with your thoughts, advice, and for all of the sacrifices that you continue to make to advance the science and advance therapeutics. So on behalf of Dine, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention to listen to this presentation. Thank you again to Alexa and the Jet Foundation for having us. And uh, Catherine and I are happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that is very exciting and you know very promising um, for the community. And thank you for sharing um, that information. I think that you know knowledge is power and being able to know what the options are is is really important. So if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to put it into the Q and A box or into the chat. Um, 
if for some reason, I know that sometimes we have to process the information and then ask questions after the fact. So if there are any questions that you do find that you have after this presentation, please feel free to send them to Catherine here. Um, her email is on the screen, or you can send them to myself if you're more comfortable, alexa at jetfoundation.org, and I will make sure that they get to um, Catherine and Ash. So I'm going to give it a minute just in case anybody does have any questions. Um, but again, I want to thank you both for your time. Yeah, our pleasure. Um, thank you for having us. We know that um, asking the asking you, the Jet Foundation community, to take out some time from their schedules is is a big ask. So thank you for having us. And um, and again, as Alexa said, uh, should you have questions, you can always reach out to Catherine, um, and um, and uh, we'll get back to you as well. And if you are watching this after the fact, we do know that there are many that watch the recording. So if you do have questions after you've watched the recording as well, please feel free to again, reach out to Catherine or myself and we'd be happy to answer those questions. Uh, we do have a question. While comparing results to a Teplerson, no head-to-head -head studies while making comparison, can you please explain? Yeah, so these are, again, one of the questions we get um, all the time uh, is to contextualize the results uh, in the in light of what data is out there, whether it's natural history or uh, or other data. And so, in order to um, you know serve that that request, we wanted to uh, remind folks what has been published uh, with the Tupperson, uh, which was shown in those couple of slides, um, and then present our results next to it. So these are not head to head studies, as noted in the slide, um, rather just a way to to think about. Uh, the landscape uh, in a more holistic way. And then there is a question. I feel like this may have been covered, but can you explain how far you are at the moment from showing clinically significant results? Yeah, so, um, you know, from, from our perspective, we do believe uh, in terms of the dystrophin, that uh, the dystrophin results we've shown at this initial five milligram per kilogram PMO equivalent dose, um, we have shown, uh, you know, meaningful dystrophin uh, results. And again, if you look at the literature historically, even uh, even levels at that uh, uh, sort of 1% range um, are able to uh, be correlated with uh, functional changes. And you'll see that in the literature. Um, I think there's also a, a really nice paper uh, that um, uh, a professor Amthor has published, uh, he has a, a lab in France, that is a cross-sectional study that shows um, individuals with different levels of, of uh, dystrophin and how they're um, correlated in terms of their phenotype, uh, things like loss to ambulation. And one can see that there is benefit even in low levels of dystrophin. And then, you know, when you get to that sort of five and above percent, uh, that it's quite a, quite a different kind of uh, trajectory. Of, uh, of disease. And we do have a question that I'm not sure if you are able to answer, but um, can the delivery of this molecule be used in other muscle wasting diseases possibly down the line as well? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so the, the force platform, as I mentioned, is modular. So uh, we, uh, if we, if we think about Duchenne first, and I'll talk about some other, uh, uh, other dystrophies, um, we use the same uh, fab and linker in our therapeutics, and we can interchange that antisense oligonucleotide. So we are developing, you know, other uh, exon skipping drugs. And so for 53, for example, we would use the same fab and linker and then have an exon skipping PMO appropriate for a 53 mutation or a 45 mutation. So what we are seeing from Dyn251 is directly applicable to what we hope we would be able to see with other exon skipping PMOs, because the Fab and Link are remaining the same. Also, we have in parallel with this program, a program in adult onset myotonic dystrophy type one. And in that program, we use the same Fab and Linker and we actually use a different uh, antisense oligonucleotide that is appropriate to target the genetic, genetic basis of that disease, which is really targeted at something called um, toxic nuclear DMPK. 
So uh, we are able to actually leverage the platform from a safety perspective, right? We were able to accumulate quite a bit of safety data from two clinical programs to help give us confidence, even more confidence in the overall uh, you know, safety uh, profile for this particular platform. And yes, it can be used across different kinds of muscle disorders. And we are in fact doing that now. And also in January, we released our um, uh, initial positive proof of concept data from the adult onset myotonic dystrophy type one program. That's super exciting. That's awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Awesome. If there are any other questions, I will give it another minute. Um, but thank you all for being here. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day as well to join us. We know that, you know, especially when it comes to time zones, it can be tough. So we appreciate you all being here. Um, again, write down Catherine's um, email. If you do have questions, I'm happy to answer. I know she is. She's amazing. And then um, me, Alexa at jetfoundation.org. Happy to get those to uh, Dr. Dugar and um, Catherine as well. So with that, I will say thank you. Thank you for being here. And we appreciate your time. And we hope to see you again soon. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.